All right, let's see where we're at here. All right, it's 10 a.m. Without further ado, I'm going to get started because there's a reasonable amount to cover today. Uh, this first hour, as usual, it's going to be um, figure drawing. We are going to talk about the image you see on the screen right now and how to break it apart anatomically speaking. So hopefully you've already watched the anatomy uh, lecture video where we cover all of the muscles and all of the stuff to look for. If you haven't done that, then this session is going to be a little trickier. I'll try to keep it, uh, I'll try to keep it understandable, but I am going to be referring to the muscles and things as if you've experienced them or, you know, heard of them, studied them a little bit. So just beware that uh, you should have already watched lecture on anatomy or at least have your anatomy reference available to refer to. Um, yeah, so before I kick off, so this is a drawing I did yesterday to sort of prep for today. We're going to draw. This is sort of the state to which you can get your drawing before you start dissecting all of the muscles. Now, some of these decisions in the line and stuff are made by me with a nod towards the anatomy because of what's there. Like I can decide what's there a little better because of my experience with anatomy. If you don't have that experience, which I suspect you don't, it's going to be about being super careful with how you draw your drawing uh, through gesture, up through measuring, up through overlapping, that kind of stuff. You're going to need to be extra careful about that so that you're set up as good as possible to deal with the anatomy. In the future or moving forward, you're not always going to break your model. You might end the drawing right here or you might move on to shading or something right now. Knowing what's there helps you make better decisions about what it is you're looking at and how to put that down on the page. And that's something I echo nearly nonstop in this class is knowing what's there helps you decide how to best show that in a drawing. So important bits before we kick off into the anatomy, at least as far as this drawing is concerned, overlaps are huge. So getting, getting this overlap proper, uh, being able to see that in the image and represent it in the drawing, the overlaps happening through here, the overlaps down here. We have like the front of the stomach here and the side here. Being able to see that and show those overlaps is going to be really important. So if you're missing overlaps, if your overlaps aren't making sense, uh, it's something to really work on that can really enhance the believability of what's happening in your figure. Uh, to get an overlap wrong is to tell us the wrong thing about what is in front of what, and that makes things visually confusing. And on a figure, it's so subtle everywhere. You want to make sure you're being deliberate and conscious about what is in front of what, what's the overlap doing right there, you know, all throughout. All right, so that's for sort of before we get started on that. Uh, I want to go over... I'm looking at your handout right now. I just want to go over like a basic map of the back. So the demonstration video that I did already is uh, or the one that's in the modules that you have in class. Those of you that have the in-class stuff, it's a front. So I sort of go through drawing and breaking down the front of the model. So I decided for the live stream today, we'll do the back. And this one's a little bit oblong, it's off to the side, there's a little bit of twist and bend to it, so there's there's some three-dimensional stuff to consider here. But, but before we do that, from just a basic back standpoint, this is the, this is kind of the breakdown, <clears throat> excuse me, 
of the back anatomy as I would consider it if I'm just being really basic with it. So here's, here's the stand-in for the spine. I'm just gonna make a straight line. Obviously our spine curves and all that for, for the sake of this, we're just gonna go spine as a straight line. The major, what I like to do first is find the bony landmarks uh, and sort of describe a little bit of what the bones are up to so I can make a little better sense of what the muscles are doing relative to those bones. So for our basic back, we're gonna have some kind of rib cage there. And then on that rib cage, we're gonna have a couple of bones. And this is where uh, I, you kind of have to break apart the anatomy if we're doing like torso, then arm, then leg. At some point, the arm begins and the torso ends. Where is that? Uh, I don't think right here at the trunk is a good place. I think the arm ends with those with the bones that are attached to it here and in the front. So we deal with those in the arm, but it's good to know them here. And particularly for the back, it's good to know that you have two bones that are triangle shaped. When you're at rest, they're kind of in line with the spine on the inside. They go out like this. And they're called scapula, the scapula or scapulae. We'll be talking about those when we talk about the arm more specifically, but they're for our purposes here, I see them, they're gonna help us with the muscles. All right, and then just maybe that half circle for the hips. Again, this is a basic breakdown. All right, so that's my bony landmark situation in the back. There's really not a whole lot to it. Maybe I can put like a the base of a skull up here just to, wrap, just to finish things off. So that's my basic bony situation. What are the muscles doing? The first one I like to find is the, is the uh, latissimus dorsi. It's the one that's kind of the bath towel shape. It wraps around and up into the armpits. So it goes from down here at the base of the back up into the armpit. And it kind of does like this. It's like an S curve from the armpit down like that. And then it wraps like this again really overly simplified. All right, so that's latissimus dorsi. The next one I like to find is trapezius. It's the next biggest. I like to find the big stuff first and then fill in the little blanks. All right, that helps me make sense of things a little better. The next biggest one is the trapezius. It goes from the base of the skull down. There's that seventh cervical vertebra right there. And it overlaps. It comes over the top of latissimus dorsi. This is kind of the inner margins of it like that. And then it comes from the base of the skull out to this point like that, like that. And then it goes in like this, almost straight, I would say. And then it goes like that, kind of a little S curve. All right, that just leaves these little openings here to deal with. So there is a muscle of the arm, that shoulder muscle comes, we'll just get it out of the way here. It kind of comes like this. We'll just do basic arm there. That's Those arms are gonna get, leave me with these little triangles. Inside of which we have this teres major muscle that sits sort of in the bottom of that triangle and then infraspinatus, which sits in the top of that triangle. The only other thing, external abdominal oblique, which you can see, and it's gonna come down. Maybe there's like a little bit of rib here and rib there. Okay, there is, so that's not the final thing actually. There is a that double column situation in the bottom of the back. So the erector spinae comes up as like two columns. You can usually see it pretty strong in the lower back here. And then depending on the model, you can see it go all the way up into the back. And this can depend on the model or the pose. 
kind of goes up like this. I'm going to draw it lightly just to hint at it. All right, so that's sort of the basic muscle situation in the back. Ooh, sternocleidomastoideus would poke out right there. Those are the things I'm going to be looking for. And if you can build this map, and I would encourage you to just play around with it, uh, just try and build this map on your own without, eventually without reference, but looking at your, looking at a good reference can certainly help you with that. If you can get the basics down, and if I were to maybe simplify this even more basic, it's like spine, ribs, and scapulae, torso. Um, big triangle in the lower part. Diamond in the upper part. And then like going to be as basic as possible here. Then like this triangle is split in half there. Straight lines there and there. And straight lines here. Right? That's kind of the map as well if I were to just geometric and go super simple with it. These are just the things you're looking for. Not anatomically convincing here. Once you add the shape to them, then they get more anatomically convincing. All right, so that being said, let's try to puzzle apart what is happening in this figure. And I'm going to use vine charcoal for this because it gets out of the way. This is charcoal pencil here. I gestured in vine charcoal and then added charcoal pencil to get my contours nice and clean so they wouldn't smear off too badly. I'm doing this on toned paper to give myself the option to dress it up with white and black and be able to work both directions like we uh, have done so far. Gray paper really is a nice, and I say gray, but it could be brown, it could be blue, anything middle value like this. It's nice to be able to add darks and add lights and kind of have that both ranges uh, to go towards. All right, for efficiency and, and all of that. All right, so the first things I'm gonna look for, I'm gonna be looking for bones. I wanna know where the bones are in this pose. Like what are they, what are they doing? Uh, I could use a red pencil for this or blue pencil to kind of keep it separate from the muscles, but I'm gonna use vine because then I can just smear it and accentuate the muscles on top or something. Uh, I know, so I'm going to find that oval for the ribs, um, and I know that it's right, I know there's ribs right here, I can see them on the model. I can imagine there's some back here, and I know they kind of go up into the neck there. So I'm going to just, real basically, say... Mm, That's going to be my rib oval. And I've got my spine that comes down. I, that contour that I put down is really a nice one for the spine. I can just kind of leave it. All right, now the trick. And because we're dealing with the back, uh, once we've covered all the anatomy, then you kind of do it holistically like this. The scapulae are things that we have not covered yet, but I do need to get them in here because the back muscles kind of depend on those. So I'm looking for three points that make a triangle. One of them is this divot here. I see the shadow in the model. There's like a patch right here of slightly shadowy stuff. That's one point of my triangle. Another point of my triangle is going to be up towards like right where there's like a hard bump out on the edge of the shoulder. Again, we cover this in the arms, but this is kind of one spot where it's like, is it arm? Is it torso? If I'm finding this bone, I need to know this landmark. It's out on the edge here. And this is going to be a simplification of this bone in the back, but I need it anyway. 
Now I'm looking for a third one that's buried in here somewhere and it's kind of like this. I see there's like a little change in the lump there. Yeah, that's gonna be good enough. I'm almost I'm allergic to the words good enough, but it is what it is. All right, now I need to figure out the next one. This one's gonna to be tougher because it's kind of on the other side. So it's like this, let's see. That's going down a little bit more. I can kind of measure because the the body is symmetrical side to side. I can kind of measure and see where would I end up if I followed this angle. And chances are with both of these arms down, those triangles are going to match. I'm going to say somewhere down here. It's almost covered up by this big pad of muscle. And that's one thing with this guy is he's really muscly. All right, so I have kind of like my two triangles here, my oval for the ribs and the spine going through. I'm gonna ghost those just so that they sit back a little bit while I work on the muscles now. I can throw pieces in there as well. All right. Okay, so bath towel muscle, the latissimus dorsi. Where does it start? Where does it end? Uh, it starts back here. So I'm looking for that sweep, that S sweep up around. I'd say bath towel because you like put a bath towel under your, like in your armpits and then it swoops around your back. That's how I think of it. So I, I'm looking for a muscle that's gonna go into the armpit here, sweep down and up into the other armpit. And then it's going to come at the bottom half. It's going to come together down here at the base of the spine. I already have a little bit of that. Like I can see the shadow in the model out of this armpit. There's a little shadow and it's kind of, it's headed this way. We get some lumpiness here, but it's headed this way. That is the bottom margin of this latissimus dorsi. So I'm going to put that in because it's kind of, it's easier for me to see here. And then it cuts over like that. All right, that's gonna be one little part. The other part, luckily he's turned, so it's kind of on edge. I can see it going up and around, and, and a large part of it is this. And then we have this overlap here. Now, if you look at the image, it's like there's a big blob here if we go back to that elliptical treatment of things, there's like a big blob right here that's sitting in front of this. And what that is, is a really well-developed erector spinae group headed up into the back, All right? So this is kind of, latissimus dorsi is strong here. It's not as thick here. And we start getting those spinal, those muscles, those uh, erector spinae muscles going up that take over here. And to a certain extent, here as well, you can kind of see them headed up this way as well. So I'm going to treat those together for this bottom edge so I can maintain that overlap. All right, and if I want to on this, they kind of go, they start as these two columns and then they go up and they spread into the, into the ribs. It's almost like my hands like this and they go, and they grab onto all the ribs up here. So by the time they're up here, there's seldom, there's enough layers of muscle on top that you don't see them as much. Maybe in a really thin female model, you might see them go really far up the back because the other muscles aren't very developed. But in a model like this, and we're choosing a muscle guy because everything's just easier to see, you'll see them strong here and then they'll sort of break apart and get covered by these other muscles. All right, so that kind of gives me my bottom edge here. I feel reasonable about that. Top edge, I need to figure out where, where does my line go? Should I, should I start up here and go across there? Should I start here and come down? Where should I put it? Uh, I'm going to look at the handout 
you don't see it, but I have it on my screen. And then you could also, so here's that Morpho book I recommend, and I found a pose that's kind of similar. So this, if I move this closer, this guy's muscle situation isn't that different than my image if I tilt it to the side a little bit. So this can really give me some help on what those muscles would be doing. And here in this one, you can see the erector spinae, he's deciding to show us them going all the way up. For us, I don't think I'm gonna do that one. I think I'm gonna let latissimus dorsi be a little stronger, but in any event, doesn't quite go all the way to the armpit and it overlaps the bottom of that triangle we made a little bit. So it's like from here, maybe a little bit down from the crease and it overlaps this on its way to the spine. I want to add, I want to show off this being round. So rather than go straight or anything, if I want to show off this being round, I think I'm going to add some curve just just to keep it feeling like it's swooping around. It's like a, yeah, that roundness. I'm, this is kind of what my arm is doing is what my imagination is doing with this line. Same on this side, bottom of the triangle, armpit roughly there. It's going to go, we'll say something like that. All right, so here's my bath towel, right? My latissimus dorsi going up and sort of sweeping around the figure. And then I've got these, those, I'm just going to make a lot of hand gestures this whole drawing long. I've got these going up and kind of breaking apart part of the way up, that erector spinae. All right, so that's that's okay for now. Again, I'm doing this all in vine charcoal so I can come back and be more specific later. So I've, I've got pretty much this whole lower half figured out as far as big muscle masses go. Now I need to find trapezius. That's the these big shoulder muscles, you can see a little bit of them from the front. You can see quite a lot of them from the back. This guy has a big, it's one of those back muscles that weightlifters and bodybuilders just build into hugeness, right? They get these big pull, lumps on their shoulders. This muscle just gets big. And this guy's is big. This whole lump situation here is all that trapezius as well as on this side. So. What I'm looking for is base of the neck is where it starts. It's number 11 on your handout. Uh, base of the neck is where it starts. And I think number 10, I think I'm going to look for the uh, seventh cervical vertebra just so I can keep oriented. And I, it's right, it's like right here. I can see a bump, just a little bump on the back side of this. I'm going to call that seventh cervical vertebra. That's going to help me decide where the trapezius is flowing. So I see more of this side of the neck. All right, and I'm looking for something that comes down and out to this, the top of the shoulder. And if I look, I can see just a little, like I got it right here, there's a little overlap right there. That is the overlap for this muscle as it goes up onto the neck. So I'm going to play that up a little more. And I can even, for this part, I could even throw in some cross contour just to, like, that's going to give it a sense of being rounder. You don't have to do that, but it can be a, it can give it a nice sense of roundness if you throw some cross contour in. I might do that with my charcoal pencil later so it doesn't get too messy. All right, there's a significant overlap here. So this part of that muscle kind of folds onto itself here because he's hunched up. Stops there. All right, before I find this edge, I'm just gonna follow this part of it because I kind of already have it. But I just need to decide where does trapezius stop? And it stops down below the level of this latissimus dorsi, so it overlaps top of it. If you remember back our little basic map, the trapezius sits on top of latissimus dorsi just by a bit. So in this image, where is that? It's like right here. 
like right at the top of this bulgy thing is where trapezius ends. So I'm just gonna give myself a reminder of that right there. That's gonna be where my trapezius stops. This side, it's just this outer contour all the way to about this right here. This first little indentation is the end of trapezius. All right now, I, trapezius follows, it kind of cuts a straight line across the top of those triangles into the inner spot. So it's kind of like there. And here I'm following the top of this triangle I made. And I'm keeping an eye on my reference too to make sure I don't get too far away from sort of the bumps and stuff that I'm seeing there. This side, it's going to go here and it forms this part of the muscle kind of comes branches up like that. So we might, we might show that in the contours later. And then it's going to take an S turn down to this point I made earlier. So I'm really just connecting the dot here and here with an S shape. And if I look at the image there, I can see it sort of in this area, in that shadow area, just to the right side is sort of the edge of this muscle. And then I can get rid of that because it's vine. Same story here, this one, there's that bulge and it comes out. And it's a little more compact because he's in a slightly different position with it. Right, the S, and I'm going off of the image this time. I can see this S being a little stronger. We'll get rid of that. All right, so now I've got upper back. So latissimus dorsi, erector spinae, trapezius, uh, sternocleidomastoideus, I have an ear here. I'm always looking for that muscle. If I turn to the side, you can see it right there. Uh, it goes from behind the ear straight down to this sternal notch on the front. We don't see that here, but we do see there's a little overlap here, which is that muscle. That's that muscle shooting straight down towards that sternal notch. All right, and we don't see the other side because it's on the other side. All right, I'm going to get, there's a shoulder muscle here, here that belongs to the arm that's nevertheless kind of in the way. I need to make this triangle and what happens with this muscle, and this again is something that you'll do when you know all the muscles. It comes from this, that point there. It kind of takes... That's the trip that it takes. And I'm not gonna flesh this one out, I'm just getting it there so I can get my triangle here. All right, what's happening in this triangle? I know I've got two things happening in that triangle. One of them is teres major and it's down low, and one of them is infraspinatus and it's up high. So I'm gonna make sure and get both of those in. There is an interaction here, and if you look at your handout between 12 and 13, as they head towards the arm, so 12 is infraspinatus, 13 is teres major. As they head up towards the arm, they kind of split, and one goes in front of the arm, like from this, from this view it would go, it would dive into the armpit, and one stays out, right? And that's, we'll get to that. It's kind of an arm versus torso thing because those two muscles we talk about in the torso, but they kind of attach to the arm and are really muscles that move the arm around. Anyway, so from underneath, we're going to have
teres major. And the cool thing here is this teres major sits just underneath latissimus dorsi. You can see it on your handout as well. So it's always nice to kind of fudge that. So you get that little bulge kicking that out a little bit. Maybe I can make that a little clearer. All right, and that's the one that teres major goes down into the arm. Infraspinatus is above that, and it goes above the arm in this overlap. And this is something you just have to uh, have experience with. It's like one goes one goes in, one goes out, and then out from behind that comes this triceps. It's a muscle of the arm. We're not going to flesh it out, but. That's roughly what it's doing. Okay, how does that look over here? This is a really weird angle for teres major and infraspinatus. It's almost like we can only see, we're like looking at it long ways. So a muscle that's like this, we'll call teres major, it's just this long sort of donutty shape going this way. If we turn that into looking straight at it, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like that. It goes into perspective with us, and that's kind of wh what we're dealing with here. All right, this is, these two th lumps are just these two things side on, essentially. All right, what else do I need? I've got some stuff here to do and here to do. And maybe to an extent down here. I've got dress up that erector spinae a little bit. All right, so what am I looking at over here? I'm looking for external abdominal obliques. That's what I'm going to throw here. Just a little, we only see a tiny little bit of it there. And I've even exaggerated this from the pose, I think. Uh, but we see a bunch of it here. Where's the external abdominal oblique here? It's all this front section, all down the ribs here. Basically this, little glowing contour that I see in the shadows is the edge of that external abdominal oblique. It takes up this whole spot and then it kind of uh, on the front here there's asis and it's like right right about there. I can see where asis would be and then the other ones on the other side uh, like right there. The external external abdominal oblique dives over asis on its way down to the pubis. So that's kind of the shape there. And I'm going to play up this bulge a little bit. So that's kind of the shape that I'm dealing with that one. And then I'm looking for serratus anterior up in that armpit. And we're seeing it on such a, a drastic angle that I just barely see it. Just a few spots right there. And then there's actually some rectus abdominis that I see right here. This little thin contour in front is rectus abdominis. So thin I probably won't draw too much attention to it. All right, so let me, I'm gonna look through and see if I caught the things that I want to catch here. I've got trapezius, I've got serratus anterior, I've got erector spinae, external abdominal oblique is there, teres major, infraspinatus, seventh cervical vertebra. 
piece this is this little, these two little dots down here, kind of where everything roots to. All right, I'm going to ghost this now uh, and then add sort of a little more finesse to it. This is really just kind of the larger scheme of things. So, and this is just something I like to do. You don't have to do this, but I've just put a middle value down on top of my middle value. So I've got a lot of leeway on erasing things out, darkening some things, adding white, if I want to. Right now, I just want to define these muscles with a little more nuance. And I also need to decide where do I want people to look. I think so far it's going to be okay. Like we're going to be looking at the back here. I don't want to flesh this out because one, we're not talking about the arm, but two, it's getting close to the edge of the page. I don't really want to do a whole lot up here because that's also getting close to the edge of the page down here. I just kind of want it to drop away as it gets to the edges of the page. Keep our focus here in the center. And I think I'm going to start. I'm going to start up and then work my way under. So trapezius is going to be the first one that I describe. The nice thing is I've already done the work here. So I don't need, I don't need to fuss about where things are. I just need to essentially follow the, connect the dots, trace the drawing I've already done. And I'm thinking about line variety here. So not, it's not a same hard line everywhere. It's like hard here and then it drops off, it gets lost here a little bit. Just trying to make it a little more interesting. I like to use a little bolder lines where there's an overlap let the lines drop off where there's just like a bulge that's in the silhouette, like out here. I might add a line here and then just let it drop off there. Definitely darken it there. All right. It's that seventh cervical vertebra again. And I think I'm going to add a little bit of cross contour to this just to highlight the musculature. I think I'm going to do fibers, maybe not too intensely. I could always add them later, but kind of this, this treatment or maybe even, let's see, do I have something here? Yeah, like this treatment where you've got these little lines that just kind of indicate the flow of things. Cross contours here. Cross contour, just remember from beginning drawing, it's like lines that go around a thing to sort of describe the three dimensional nature of that thing. This is essentially a tube, so I'm doing these kind of ellipse, sort of round lines. If it's hard for you to figure out where to, to make the fibers come out, like how to make them wrap, a good reference is really helpful for that. There's an orientation to muscle fibers. Uh, 
And it's good to get that in your drawing. I don't want to get too carried away there, but I'm going to call that trapezius. I'm going to get sternocleidomastoideus while I'm at it here. And this overlap, because that's going in front, I think I'm just going to Just add a little darkness, a sense that it's going around the other side of that. All right, I'm going to bring this muscle back and I'm just going to leave it as a ghost because we're not looking at it here, but I need it to help show off this triangle. I think I'm going to do, I'm going to work down here first. I'm going to do like I did when I drew it in. I'm going to do the uh, latissimus dorsi first, and then I'm going to deal with the triangle stuff. Now, depending on the reference that you have, let's see if this has, you get these lines here that kind of fan out towards the hips on the latissimus dorsi. And what that really is, it's kind of like, this is where the muscle fibers start, right? The, the actual body, the bulk, the, the muscle belly, it's called the, the actual contracting fibers of the latissimus dorsi don't really exist that much against the spine here. It's just a thin, flat sheet of nothing essentially here, just connective tissue. The muscle itself doesn't start until just a little ways away from the spine. So you can add some kind of sense of that. It's like towards starting from the spine and fanning out towards the hips. Uh, these fibers don't show up until there-ish. So it's just, uh, for this drawing, it's just gonna be kind of a decorative thing. But sometimes you really do see that, uh, that this muscle, like it gets large right here. There's some underlying muscles that might push it up, but then its muscle belly starts right there. So you get these kind of lumps. It's a little bit what's happening here on this side of this guy. Part of this is editing though too. I'm trying to figure out what's gonna clearly show the muscle groups here. And I think I'm going to do, I'm going to echo what's going on up here in the neck, down here in the base of the spine too, just to give us a full, sort of full feeling here. So that means looking at this, am I above it or below it? I think I'm below or above it rather, sorry. If I were to look at this, the hips here, am I looking up at them or am I looking down at them? And if I'm looking at this pose, it looks like I'm looking down at them. So that means the bottom of the cylinders or the bottom of these columns in the lower back are going to be rounded downwards. And so the cross contours are going to do that as well. All right, that's going to give me a sense of, the, of that column as it comes up.
Got to be careful not to use too strong of a line everywhere. All right, what do I want to do here? Let's go. All right, I need fibers that head towards the armpit and away. All right, I may revisit this spot. So I might want to go I might want to go the other way with my cross contour so that my latissimus dorsi comes here and then bounces out. Uh, I might need to get rid. So I've got two opposing line sets here, one that goes up like that and one that goes across like this and it's making this kind of X pattern. I don't really want that, so I'm gonna deal with that in just a minute. Once I get these other places fleshed out, I'm gonna come back and deal with that. Terry's major, oriented this way. I need to be careful here that I don't like you see right here, I can start losing the muscles. Right? They can start blending into each other if I do too much of this fiber treatment. The remedy for that is going to be just to restate that line between them a little bit more so I still am looking at this group separately. If you do fibers everywhere, you can lose the sense of your muscles. There's actually two muscles up here, but for the sake of this, we are treating them as one. All right, and if I want to further make this stuff clear, I can actually come in anywhere there's like a little triangle gap. There's muscles deep underneath that, but They're deep, so we're not gonna talk about them right now. Well, we're not gonna talk about them in this class. So that's gonna show those muscles way more clearly because I've got a little gap here, a little gap there, and even a gap here, uh, which again, there's muscles that kind of go this way, deep underneath. Not, uh, don't worry about those for now. See on this side. All right, then I have to decide, am I losing those? Are they two separate from each other? I think they're still, they're still reading as two separate muscles, so I'm okay.
little bit of serratus anterior there. redesign this little part here so that it's got a little more of that hip there's a that in the hips there's the wing from asis to pieces there's a wing and before i had it kind of swooping down I didn't really like how that was making it feel i maybe want to highlight that wing of the hips there from pieces here to asis there and then design my muscle uh, uh, external abdominal oblique around that And here I'm using the muscle orientation, the muscle fibers on the handout. They're kind of along this wing. They go up and they sort of come together in, they kind of go this direction. Take as long as you need when you're doing these, by the way. Um, as long as you need to figure out the orientations. I'm moving a little bit quick here. And truth be told, it might be nicer for me to slow down a bit and get these orientations a little more uh, carefully represented. All right, I want to deal with this. I need to decide what I want to do about that. Do I want to highlight this erector spinae group or do I want to highlight the latissimus dorsi right there? Um, it is a good question. I think I'm going to, on this upper half, I'm going to Using the handout as a as a sort of guide on this upper half, I'm going to let latissimus dorsi be more important. And it's kind of like this line kind of matches with this line as far as the fibers are concerned. And then maybe down below that, we'll just stick to cross contour because it's about, let's see. Yeah, that's good. I could do fibers going this way along that erector spinae group, but I think I'm just gonna leave it there for now. All right, so that's gonna be roughly the muscle situation in the back. The rest of this is going to be, and we've got what, like five minutes-ish left. I'm lightening up these holes because I, upon looking at them, I kind of don't like them that much. All right. The rest of this is going to be window dressing. I can be like, okay, what am I looking at? Uh, I can use the model as inspiration and go, there's, there's some light spots here. 
this would be catching light. I'm just now it's like playing that light shadow game. Uh, so I can try and use the model as light, as uh, help for doing light and shadow type stuff where I'm trying to, you know, things that are facing up towards the light are catching light. And they get shadowy as they come down. Or uh, if I if I want things to seem a little more, I don't know, anatomically, muscly, whatever, I can do like the tendons down here. There's like white and then it goes dark into the muscle belly and then the white comes back. You can sort of dress that out any number of ways. I'm just going to play with my eraser for now. Add a little bit of dimension to this. And again, this is gray paper. I haven't even used anything white yet. If I just drag a line with my eraser across that orientation, I get that shiny spot. I can do it again down here. Right, you end up with, it's really quick and you end up with something that seems kind of a little shinier. Maybe that's what I want to do. Whatever you do at this point, let me say this, whatever you do at this point, make sure that it's in service of clear anatomy. Don't do anything that's going to make the anatomy fall apart or uh, become muddy or confusing or not, uh, not clear. So you can almost do whatever. You can fully shade, you can add muscle fibers, you can do all kinds of things. Just don't obscure the anatomy. Don't let the muscles mesh into each other. Is mesh a word? It is now. Here I have that Conte stick now. Up to this point, I've been using charcoal pencil, vine charcoal and charcoal pencil only. I'm going to muscle fiber this one out just so you can kind of get a sense for where things could go. A little bit of white Conte. Some white on that seventh cervical vertebrae.
All right, so if I wanted to keep up with this, obviously it'd take me much longer. Maybe knock off some of that obnoxious white there. All right, this still this is still separate from everything else. It's just getting a lot richer now. I can go through and do that with all of the rest of these muscles and really end up with something that's super substantial feeling. Right now it still feels pretty study like but if you were to go through and do this, the rest of it, it would be solid and just really have a lot of presence. But as you can see, that's gonna take, I mean, that'd take me another couple of hours probably of of working with it, which I may decide is worth it. Knock back some of that. White gets really intense on this gray paper. I like to approach it a little more slowly. All right, I'm gonna call it there for the anatomy torso. This is the back. If you want to get a look at the front, that's the instructional video. There's a full length one I would highly recommend that you watch um, because it's just like today. It's just I go through and talk about the decisions that I'm making, why I'm doing what I'm doing and so on. Uh, what I would say is don't, so you have images to choose from. This is for the students in the class. You have images to choose from. Don't just grab an image and wing it, right? You saw me refer, like I know all these muscles. I can map them more or less from scratch. I know what I'm looking for and I've still got a reference on hand. Don't try to wing this. It's going to show. It's totally going to show. It's gonna be, I, uh, there's gonna, it's gonna, you'll be living in the land of good enough or I don't know what I'm looking at, right? So don't be there, use your reference, puzzle apart what's happening. Uh, if I could offer advice, it'd be like, the shape of the muscle is important, but where it starts and where it goes is also extremely important. So where does the muscle begin and how does it flow? When you know that for the muscles, it, things just things keep getting easier and easier and easier. You, you can start making better and better and better decisions. All right, that is it for figure. If you have questions, don't hesitate to contact. Uh, and this week, uh, this week's torso, next week's going to be, I think, arm and then leg. I think that's the order we go in. So for better or worse, we split them that way. You've got torso, you've got arms, you've got legs, and that's pretty much the body anatomy we're going to cover. Uh, then we'll move on. After three weeks from now, we'll be talking about hands and heads, and we'll sort of be headed towards the end of the semester. So, all right, good luck, y'all, for figure. Let us switch gears and talk about beginning drawing. unnatural switching of gears but that's all right let's close that okay you beginning folks we are talking about fabric and uh how to deal with it. So like, likewise with the uh, figure drawing class, if you have not watched the lectures on fabric, you're going to want to do that because that's where we talk about all the stuff I'm about to be looking at with this fabric. And I'm gonna do a quick measurement of this real quick. It's about a square. So my first, my first thing is, do I want to go like this or do I want to go like that? I think I'll just leave it vertical. Makes better sense on the 
on the screen. All right, so with fabric, the things that we want to think about first, so I'm gonna draw this uh, in whatever I can get done in the hour that we're doing here. I'm gonna draw this yellow fabric. You see the references that you have in class, again, for the students is, uh, they're not this fabric, but similar. It's a single piece of fabric draped from a couple of pins. And this is going to help us flex our muscles and get some practice with the idea of tension points and the form of the fabric, the flow of the fabric, and then light and shadow as well. So the first, first things first is I'm going to put on my editing hat here and say there's something that I need to ignore. And that is all of those flipping wrinkles over this whole fabric. I am not going to draw those yet. I can add those on top of the actual form of the fabric. So you can almost think of wrinkles as like texture on a larger form. It's like, oh, what's a good example? I don't know, like alligator skin or something. If you get started just drawing all the individual little intricate details of the alligator skin without a sense of what the tube of alligator tail is. I don't know why I'm picking that, but if you start into the details without the idea of the bigger tube that it sits on, you're at a disadvantage. You're going to get lost in the weeds. Things It'll be harder to keep a sensible structure, three-dimensional, observational, convincing structure going on. So for the purpose of this fabric, I'm thinking about major forms. That's the shape of the fabric, the big flows, that head back to the tension points, not the wrinkles to start. <clears throat> we're on toned paper for this as well. We've got the Conte sticks, so we're gonna be working in dark and in light with the Conte sticks. Love them or hate them, that's what we're doing, at least for this week. If you want to use charcoal pencil, you can. What I would av advise against is graphite. Don't use graphite on this one. You press too hard with graphite, your charcoal and Conte game is, I won't say it's over, but it has shifted. Uh, so make sure you're sticking with charcoal Conte for this one. And what I might do for this is maybe vine charcoal. They've got it or a charcoal pencil just to gesture things in. And you know what? I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to start with the Conte and stick with the Conte just so we're... Stick, stick them with Conte for this one. I'll have my eraser on hand, but I don't think I'm going to use it that much. The key here is to be light and sensitive about what I'm drawing. All right, so starting off, it's just a V shape. So the top of it is curved kind of steeply like this. And then it comes down to a point here. See, the tops are roughly the same height from each other. And I have like a V, like a point here that's off to the side just a little bit. And I have another little point there that's just kind of offset from it a tad. All right, so the nice thing about fabric, it's as long as you're paying attention to the fabric edge the flow of folds to the tension points, you can get away with fudging things size-wise. Like I can scoot things in, I can make things bigger or smaller or differently shaped because fabric is very movable. It's not like a human figure or a vase or something solid and sort of consistent. Fabric changes so much that we actually have some leeway in how we represent it. As long as we're adhering to the general principles of fabric, then it's gonna be convincing, it's gonna be believable, even if our sizes are different. The only time that's not necessarily gonna be the case is if you have clothing or something on a figure and you're if you mess with that too much, you can start cutting into your figure and having things seem awkward. But if it's just draped fabric, curtains, something laying somewhere, or whatever, you actually have quite a bit of leeway in how you treat it. All right, so I need to identify my tension points. I have one here and one there. And I think I'm just going to lightly mark where those are just to remind me where my fabric flow is. 
All right, now I'm looking for contours. So I'm gonna structure this thing out as far as what the edges and contours are doing. And just as a reminder, a contour is like the edge of a thing. So maybe I'll pull these out. Uh, the contours on these headphones, anywhere that's facing, so my line of sight is coming in this way. Anything that's facing 90 degrees to that is going to make a good place for a contour. So all the way along this edge, because that's all facing, if my line of sight's coming this way, anything 90 degrees to that, I hope that makes sense, is going to be a good place for a contour. So back edge here, inside this part there, obviously this edge here, right? If I'm looking at my hand, where are the contours? There's one there, there's one here, edges of the, edges of the fingers, front of the thumb, these knuckle folds, they're like skin that is folding in and has turned 90 degrees to my eye. I probably put a contour line there. You kind of, that's part of the artistic decision-making process. Where should I put a contour line? Wherever you have a flat thing that turns to being 90 degrees, that's a good place for a line. All right, so that's gonna be one of my organizing principles here. I'm working really lightly by the way. Right down here at the bottom of this groove, an interesting thing is happening. This back piece of fabric is going behind. This front piece is coming in front. So I'm going to make sure that shows up because that's a hallmark of fabric is those kinds of overlaps. All right, this is a diaper fold. So we've got increasingly steep folds going like, you can see the sort of stacked U folds going up here. So tension point here, there's a strong line that comes down like that. And I'm not gonna take it out into the front here because I'm no longer in contour area here. Here the fabric is turned like that. So I'm gonna put a line all the way down here until it looks to me like it kind of fans out. Like it goes from being like this to sort of out like that. I'm gonna stop my contour before I get to that, this area down here. All right, there's another line there and it's got a little squiggle right there again we have a lot of leeway here and then it's just fabric edge all the way down all right there's some cool stuff happening right up in here i want to get that's really saying fabric and it's at the top of this you get this loop like that, little dark loop like that. I hope you can see it. And then it waves down and back up like this. This is almost like the edge of those curtains that we were doing in the sketchbook. It's this wavy thing that comes down. And then it juts out and there's an edge of fabric here, but I'm gonna figure out this wrinkle stuff up here first because right up here, there's a cut. I can't see it in the reference image quite so well, but I know it's there because the top of this fold, the tension point is here, here's a fold. There's gonna be a line that goes like that. And then another one that goes from this back to the tension point. Then there's one that goes down. There's like the point of fabric here. It tucks behind like this. Yeah.
So all of those overlaps are really going to be important overlaps. There's another one. I'm missing one right here that's really going to flesh this end out, and it's just this edge on its way back. Yeah, and this really reminds me of those curtains. That little area, it's like those curtains that we were drawing in the sketchbook practice where you have to get those lines that head back towards the vanishing points. So now it's starting to feel fabric-y there. Just looking at contour edges and getting this, anything you see that's like this, so there's some of it here, there's some of it there, there's some happening down in here. Those are gonna be important parts to get accurate. Let's see what we have here. This cuts behind that, and then this juts back out. So I'm just gonna change the shape here a little bit. Because I like how it overlaps there. That's another sort of fabric-y moment in the reference where the front piece of fabric is sitting just slightly in front of the back piece of fabric. All right. I feel pretty decent about this part so far. Let's work on some of these. Now, there's a ton going on right up in here. There's a lot of wrinkles, which means a lot of contours. You might pick the most important ones first and then come back and add littler ones after. Don't get so hung up on exactly where things are that you drop the ball, I guess. Uh, if you do use your drawing, if you do what you see on your drawing sensibly, it'll be just as convincing as what you see, even if the shapes are slightly different. Right? This is more about the principles of what fabric does than about the exactitude of the particular thing you are drawing. I hope that makes sense. That doesn't mean, hey, it can be really oversimplified and, and non-descriptive and that's fine. That's not, what it, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this is a different size than what's in the image. However, once the image is gone, you'll, it'll be believable all the same because everything is working the same way it does in the image, right? There's that kind of leeway. Similar to this side, it opens up. This contour comes down and opens up. So I'm going to fight the urge to make it a strong contour. All right, this was that. This is just kind of a wide open piece of fabric. So I'm gonna get this edge in. And I'm gonna pay attention to this edge. It's not just a straight line like I've done here, like I added a bit of waviness to this. I'm gonna be on the lookout for that on this side as well. Uh, I think though, I think I'm actually gonna hold on that because I don't want this to dictate where I end up up here. So I'm gonna do this top like I did that top and then I'll just make, I'll connect the dots essentially. So it juts out like so. This looks like a sharp point to me, but I'm gonna look at my reference really closely and make sure that there's not, I get the sense there's some wrap over and I really wanna get that. And so I think what I'm gonna add here, even without zooming way in on the reference, is just a little loop there. That little loop is gonna make it feel more fabric-y. And I think it is there. I'm using the reference to make that decision, but I'm also using my my desire to avoid perfect edges like that where it's fabric's wrinkled up. It's okay down here because it's the end piece of the fabric, but up here where it's interacting, you want to avoid too perfect 
of a ending of things. It's going to seem oversimplified and not as convincing if you do that. I notice this contour comes through here and it kind of stops right about there and it points to this flat spot here, which juts up like this. Again, edge of fabric, so a corner is not bad. And then it bumps out like this. Then almost from that corner, out comes this bit, just a wrinkle in the fabric. And that's gonna be my connect the dots point here that I sort of attach those two things with. And then I've got a nice cool, there's a wrinkle back here or like a fold back here that's really nice, it's like the curtain fold as well. And I think what I'm gonna do is draw the fabric edge first and then the line that goes back. So it starts right here and it ends right there and it's just a loop. If you look at the fabric edge, it just goes floop like this. And then there's that edge headed back towards the tension point. And in fact, I could probably have done a better job of that, leaning it in just a little bit to make it head back towards that tension point even better. Okay, I almost, it's like an S here, like a real gentle S. I'm just gonna do like blind contour. I'm gonna start drawing and just follow my eye. It's not perfectly blind though, because I am paying attention to where I'm headed. There we go. That little bit of waviness is gonna have it feeling like fabric. All right, so that's my, my basic contour situation. The only, I'm kind of behind in one spot. Actually, I'm gonna add just a little bit there. Uh, I'm behind in one spot, which is right here. I need to get this just a little more carefully described before I move into adding the shadows on this one. All right, so there's an overlap right here that's nice. using a little darker line here. The nice thing about the gray paper, the black Conte, if, as long as you don't load this down really, really heavily, your white Conte can come back on top and really do a lot of reasonably good work, adding highlights and stuff, adding the light. You'll notice how much smoother mine looks than the image than the reference, it's because of those wrinkles. I'm not paying any attention to them. I'm just paying attention to the big overall stuff first. The wrinkles can come later. It feels pretty good. Let's see, that's this one comes down. All right, I think I'm ready to start adding light and shadow to this one. So I'm gonna do shadow shapes on this one, similar, if you remember back several weeks, we did, uh, we built the drawing up, we added shadow shapes. 
shading them in. Remember those spheres and the still lifes, fabrics, no different. We're still thinking about the full range of values with this fabric. So I'm going to add the shadow shapes right now. And I, don't, I only have one question I need to ask myself here, and it's, is it in the shadow or is it in the light? And that seems like an easy question, but sometimes it's not quite so easy. There are some places it's very easy, so I'm going to draw those shapes first, which is going to be, there's a cool, again, here and here and in here, there's cool shadow stuff happening. And let's not forget the shadow that's being thrown onto the wall. That can really, if, you, if you've got your fabric figured out and then you add that dark shadow on the wall, it'll just go poof, it'll just pop off the page really, really nicely. So I'm going to start this top corner and start drawing some shadow shapes. This one comes down. Up like this. Juts out like that. Down straight. Straight in like this. Narrower. Widens up a bit and goes under. All right, that's the shadow shape that I see. I'm gonna fill it in so it kind of gives me the context of what I'm up to. And this is just the first pass, so this is bound to get darker and darker and darker as I start addressing other things, but I don't wanna go full dark yet. Uh, I think the darkest shadows I'm gonna have are gonna be these ones cast onto the wall, and I could just lay down this Conte until it's as dark as I can get it for those. All right, I'm gonna hold off on the center part. I'm gonna do some over here, then we'll address what's going on in the middle here. Before I lied, I'm going to do a little cast shadow here. There's just a little bit of widening, and then it gets a little thinner. The thing here that I'm paying attention to is just that it's, it's thin at this end and thin at that end, and it kind of has a little bit of squiggle to it. That's about all you need. All right, and then there's those dark shadows on the wall again. I'll get to those after. Let's see what's going on up here. I have a little bit shadow there. There's this triangle. It's like a, it's almost like a bird. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I'm tripping. There's like a little, little bird shape. And he's sitting right on that pin. If you can do that, if you can sort of abstract what you're looking at like that's not a, a fold of fabric it's a little dark bird with a little beak that hooks down anytime you can step outside of drawing what you're actually drawing and see it as something simpler or less intimidating uh, the better shadow here cast shadows are nice because they're an, an excuse to describe what is being cast onto. So up here, this squiggle really gives a sense of, especially this little S down and back up, really gives a sense of that fabric changing direction that the shadow is on. So I'm gonna take advantage of that here as well and maybe exaggerate the S that I see. And here's something that's happening that I don't like and I'm going to change. The shadow here on my rim, on my image, sorry, my reference, it comes back up this way, right where my dark fabric back here comes together. And if I do that, like if I take my shadow here and go straight to there, it's going to look weird. Like that's a that's called a tangent where those things just perfectly line up, bonk, and it's going to look awkward, even if it's what I see in the actual image. So rather than do that. I'm just going to carry it a little further down, or I could leave it a little higher. I have to decide what what's going to look better or what I prefer. And yeah, I think I'm just going to bring it down a little bit. It doesn't have to be much. All 
right? That just avoids that perfect lineup. So anytime you have something that's perfectly lining up, you as artist, you might need to adjust it so it doesn't do that. This is one of those cases. There's a little bit of light here. And then I'm gonna fill this stuff in. Anything up here? So there's some stuff up here that's like, is it light, is it shadow? I'm gonna say some of this stuff isn't strong enough to be full shadow. It's kind of like the wrinkle here, the wrinkles there. They might get some dark treatment, but not yet. I'm gonna go ahead and darken this right now. I noticed that little back piece is darker. It goes behind this piece and underneath that curl. So I'm just reminding myself that. All right, let's deal with these. Now, the key here, the tough thing here is going to be to ignore all of the little glowing spots and all of the, I'm just looking like, what is the edge of this shadow actually doing? And I'm not getting distracted by glowing reflected light that I do see up in here. I'm not getting distracted by wrinkles so much, though this is a good opportunity to start adding some sense of the wrinkles. The cast shadow is a good place to do that. So, I'm just starting on this edge. I notice that it's irregular. It's not a perfectly smooth trip. And this is a uh, issue I see some people having is they'll be like, okay, it goes like this and it carries back up and they'll just go zoop in one quick line. And it's like, there went all of your nuance. There went all of your description. There went all of your compelling shadow uh, information in one quick zoop of not paying attention to the little undulations. So they don't have to be perfect, but they should be there if you see them, look for them. Unless you're drawing something manufactured, like perfectly symmetrical, like a vase or something, then you need that smoothness uh, to because it's such a smooth thing, manufactured thing. Anything organic or fabric-y or something like that, you're looking for the irregular, the imperfect, and so on. There's a little dip. This last little bit of the, if I look at the light almost, there's like a, it goes hop, and then zoop into this little sharp thing. And I think that's kind of descriptive and nice. So I'm gonna get that in, boom, down to here. Up, a little hook like that and in that little that little bit of shadow this shadow edge comes along when i get to about here it kind of breaks into a oh god what does it break into it breaks into like a bunch of like a crissy cross shadow shape thing here so is that the technical term? Sure. Come back this way. We have another zigzag right here in the shadow shape. I'm gonna get that. Zigzag. All right, and then for this, Gets a little dodgy through here. I'm gonna to have to make some executive decisions. First one of which is cast shadow there. 
I'm almost looking at the light shape now. There's like a little diamond, an upside down kite of light right here. There's a little bit of light popping out right there, but I think I'm going to leave it. It's a it's part of a wrinkle. It's like a wrinkle happening. So I think I'm going to leave it for now. This goes all the way up, almost to the bird mouth. It's like bird mouth. And then this long shadow starts. I'm going to fill this in in just a second. All right, it's coming down and it's irregular. There's a bit of a sharp hit there. I'm trying to meet up here. So this, I know this shadow edge comes down sort of along this wrinkle toward, closer to this light shape here. And then it stops right there, juts back in and back over. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna start here and come back this way with it and then try to maybe, maybe join the two. Then I'll fill it in. Again, there's all kinds of dark stuff happening around that are just wrinkles. I'm, I'm not paying attention to those right now. And from here, I notice, so I really, at this point, I just need to connect these two lines. And I notice the line is irregular. I can just, if I want it to seem, I can just take this Conte and kind of rock it back and forth as I draw. And it'll give me an edge that is, that is kind of wavery. Right? I don't need to get in there like with a pencil. You wouldn't do that so much, wouldn't be able to do that so much. With a Conte, you can really get in there and do that. To fill this in and see where I see where I am. Try not to rush when you're filling things in. Kind of get zen with it. I say that as I fill this in probably more rushed than I should. All right, one other shadow shape to deal with, and then I've got some more work with this dark stick, and it's coming down this way and kind of fanning out. And we have, we have a lot of wrinkles happening down here. Again, may add those. Oh, I also have a shadow shape down here to deal with. It's like these two steep ones now is kind of a last thing. And this is where this stick shines, actually. So I'll show you what I would do. I think I'm going to get this cast shadow here a little clearly. And this one as well. All right, so the nice thing about these sticks What's happening in this, If I, especially if I squint and pretend I don't see the wrinkles, I have a dark, thin, thin shape like this that gets wider and kind of lightens up as it comes this way. This stick will make that mark. I'll do like a practice run on this white paper. So, and this is a nice thing about sticks. I can drag this down and here I've not, I'm not drawing into the curve, so you see how I have like a light here. It's like a line on either end with white in the middle. That tells me I'm not using the right edge of the stick. So I was using that one, and it gives me a line on either end. If I just turn it, so instead of, I just like 90 degree turn it, what do I get? That one's better. 
Do I have an edge that's better than that? Hmm. Now, there's really only one that's got the two lines situation happening. All right, so, so now I have my edge. Let's try this again. Nice, that's just about what I'm seeing. That's the kind of line that I'm seeing. And I can take a couple of passes at it to really get the sense of fabric, but it's like that I can lay that value in, that stripe I need in like three swipes instead of spending a bunch of time like finessing the, the shape in. So out here where I just have that big line and again, like there's a thin one like that, I can kind of use the stick to my advantage there and I'm gonna go ahead and try that now. And I might come back in and make these cast shadows a little stronger, but you can see, so I start thin and then I twist this to get a wider mark. Now I can start doing that in the light anywhere I see this kind of transition happening. So these here, the ones up in here, the ones over here. So, and it's quick work. If I've practiced a little bit, it's kind of quick work. Shadow down and it widens up. This edge widens up, it's a hit there, down that edge. really just looking for any excuse I can to, to use those swipes. Mainly like half tone, like where is stuff slightly darker in this fabric? Remember, I still have white. So if I want to come back in the center and really pop stuff out, my white's going to do that down here in this fabric, through here. Right now, I'm just kind of bridging the gap between those harsh shadows that I made and the surrounding areas where things are a little darker. All right, I've got some work to do in here because I made the shadow shapes, but the bottoms, if I look at those shadows, the bottoms of the shapes are these nice hard lines that I have, but the top of them are all where fabric is coming into the light. And so it's gonna soften as it goes out into the, into the light. So I do have some core shadow work to do through there, so I'm gonna do that as well. I think right now I'm gonna put in my wall shadow. Kind of matches that fabric edge. A little darker there. I'm just shamelessly laying in the dark here. You'll notice in the reference image I have up, there's like a frilly edge there. I'm not even worried about that right now. If I try to draw a thousand little frilly edges, it's gonna really mess with my overall drawing. It's, it's too specific too soon. Let's see what we have up here. It's almost like a come and go. Come and go shadow. Until we get here. Then we have a hook coming off of this down. Boom, like that. Then 
The nice thing about this shadow I'm doing is it's kind of, it's almost consequence free. I want the shapes to be correct, but I can go full dark with it and it's you can see it starting to lift this fabric off of the page. And that's just the cast shadow along with the you know, shapes of shadow that I've made so far. I'm really laying this, really laying this down dark. The nice thing that this is gonna, the thing this is gonna do for me as well is give me a sense of how dark could it get? This is gonna be my answer to that. That's how dark it could get. So now I can compare the other stuff I'm doing in the drawing to this and be like, how does it compare to this, you know, dark stuff that I've already got down on the page? blobs out here. It's important to pay attention to this though. It's a cast shadow, so it's kind of forgiving, but it doesn't mean that it's not, it doesn't need to be specific. Like where it starts, how it's oriented to the fabric is very specific to the light source. You really want that to, to be obvious in your drawing. Here's another little tangent. This cast shadow wants to come up and just join with the edge of this fabric. I'm going to stop it from doing that just by moving it out a little bit. Offset there. This long strip is where it's gonna get really tempting to go in and just go super fast and sloppy. I'm gonna I'm gonna fight it. I'm being a little more aggressive than I normally would just because I want it to be nice and dark. And I have the option here in a bit to blending stump it or or use my fingers to really sort of work those values in nice and dark. Right in the actual fabric, you won't be you won't see me being quite so aggressive. I'm aiming for a relatively even application here. So my big head's in the way. Sorry. Uh, Relatively even application here. However, I need to get that to happen. I could swipe it all in like this and see how much faster that goes, but you can't get the darkness when it's on its side like that, it's hard to get the dark that you need. You'll snap your stick if you're not careful. Normally I would recommend against making your marks the same direction, like if I have a long thin line thing like this, making your marks along it like this as well, because it'll tend to look sloppy or faster that way. But if you're being careful and slow, you can make it work.
There's another thing I want to do with this cast shadow before I move back to the fabric. As soon as I'm done filling it in, we're going to talk about it. Alright, now I get a nice sense of this thing. That cast shadow really did a ton of lifting as far as like popping this off the page. I still have work ahead of me to make the fabric feel like it's three dimensional, but it has popped off the, this now reads as background support for this, which is good. There's a thing happening in the shadow that I want to capitalize on. And I don't know if you can see it in the reference very well, but we've talked about it. And that's that where the shadow is closer to the fabric, you get these sharp edges, but as it gets further from the thing casting it, so down here, those edges start to blur. This back edge here is quite blurry. That one's sharp. Sharp-ish blurs. So I'm going to try and go in and, and get at that. I'm going to show you. Here we go. You can get it with a blending stump. So the nice thing about a blending stump is I can come in and really smooth In a very specific way, I can smooth out what I've done here. These are not on your materials list. You don't have to have them. But if you're after a really smooth situation, they really do a great job of just evening out the inconsistencies that might be in your application. All right, and right now I kind of have the same, the same edge all the way down here, the same hardness. If I come back with this blending stump and just look at my reference, it's like blurrier down here, this edge. It's subtle, but it's starting to blur there, and I can maybe make it even more obvious with my finger here. You see this Conte, the blending stump can blend it pretty well and move it around, but you can see the Conte doesn't really want to, to smear that well. Clean up some of that over, over smear. That edge is pretty blurry. That one's sharp though, because it's coming from real close. It's this little corner right there going pop onto the wall. This is farther up. This is farther up. Try not to get my head in the way is one of life's great difficulties. So if I do that throughout that hard edge versus soft edge, it's going to feel like light. Like there's going to be a, like you're going to feel the lamp right over here because of that cast shadow treatment. Uh, so bear that in mind. It's worth spending a little time. The cast shadow helped pop things out, but it's worth taking some time to deal with the edges of that cast shadow as well. Uh, here's another option for filling in. I've got vine charcoal. If I just go along the top, just lay this on top of the Conte, I can use my finger to, to essentially achieve the same effect as the blending stump. Because this Conte, or because this uh, vine charcoal really likes to smear easily, it's great at filling in those little little paper texture inconsistencies, you know, smoothing out this shadow.
right? And if I want to, I can just kind of go overboard with it like that and then come back with my eraser and clean it up. There's really quite a lot of flexibility here. It sharpens up actually towards this point. I'm going to make it a little sharper. And then, oh, time-wise, we're getting down to the wire, so I'm going to start adding some white stick here. All right, so first thing, though, I want to talk about transitioning this into the light. If I come back in here and just... With a blending stump, I can tease that edge. And again, I'm softening this upper, this upper edge. I'm going to leave the bottom edge nice and hard because that's how cast shadows behave. All right, so that's blending stump getting me there. I can also do the vine charcoal trick same way. So just bridge this gap fine charcoal, smooth with my finger, and I've now softened that edge heading up. And I'm not going to get to everything on this one, obviously, in the time frame today, but That'll, that gives you an idea of how I'd start to soften and deal with the with those fabric folds. And I still have quite a lot of room to go with this stick. And I think I'm going to look at it. I'm just going to tease out a few places, bearing in mind that this would be part of the general project of, of shading everything smoothly, as it were. So this shadow is a little darker. So that cast shadow gave us a lot of pop. This white stick's going to do some good stuff as well. The key here is do not let this white stick get in to the shadows. It doesn't belong there, not in this drawing. I'm going to get some of that wrinkly stuff in dealing with this white stick right now. So I can kind of go, oh, there's a light patch here. Right, I get that little textural hit right there, and it's just gray paper. I just didn't put the white on that part of it. Once you start adding the white, and this is word to the wise or word of warning, once you start adding the white, your blending should pretty much be done. Don't blend anymore. If I start smearing this, it's going to go mud black. So really try to avoid that. And this shadow should be more developed, but I'm still going to add white stick just so you can sort of see some of this build up. So now opposite this, I have a similar thing I could do with the white. Swiping that in.
So take your time on this part. I would advise getting things more, getting a little more value laid in before moving on to the white, but this is to sort of show you, you still have a lot of, a lot of uh, room to draw even after uh, getting this far into the drawing. If you think of the gray paper as sort of your half, your halfway, you can get the thing almost fully shaded and still only be half of your value, you know, your light and dark potential. Right, this is going to be a, a do as I say, not as I do situation because I would highly encourage you to get the values built up a little better before moving on to the white stick. And I think I'm going to leave the white stick off the wall so that this, so that the fabric becomes the most important thing. Now it's like if you want some of that wrinklage, you can put it in, but I would be, I would select wisely, right? You don't need every single wrinkle. And in fact, you can kind of use what you see as, as inspiration. It's like I noticed on this thing, there's like these things that, these wrinkles that kick out this way. Maybe I'd pick up a couple of those it's like they're a hard edge on top and they drop down like that. And then there's like a light section here that comes to a point. And then maybe I bring the black stick back and go, you know what, some of these some of them have a little stronger lower shadow and I start getting some of that wrinkly stuff but you can see it's starting to it's starting to pull attention in a way that maybe I I don't want it to so just be careful don't overdo don't overplay your hand when it comes to wrinkles I should say and I don't know how wrinkly I think a couple of your examples are are not very wrinkly Make this edge a little more interesting and firm it up a little bit. This could all go darker as well. Here I am adding in some of those wrinkles in the bottom part. All right, so hopefully that gives you an, uh, a start on this. Uh, this is going to be, it's now 12.05, so I'm gonna call it here, but 
this I could, you know, it's several more, a couple more hours, I would say for me on this to get it fully where I want. Uh, I've just dealt with kind of broad strokes so far. Getting down in here and reclaiming some of the reflected light that I see. I'm not going to use the white stick, but I can get that reflected light to glow just by lightening it up a little bit. That might even be too light. I can also get it to glow by darkening, darkening the core shadow. That would be the thing that I would carry on with at this point. I have my structure. I've got everything there. It's just value transitions now. Where is the edge hard? Where is it soft? Darkening to cast shadows the way they need to be working these transitions. Uh, spend enough time on it and enough care and you really get this dimensional drawing out of it. All right. That is it for the fabric. Uh, Next week we'll be doing fabric again. It's going to be new pastel on toned paper. So same idea. The, comp the fabric's gonna be more complicated and not complicated. It's gonna be striped fabric. So there's a lot of like flowing contours to think about. Um, so make sure you're comfortable or at least familiar with how to structure this fabric out because when we do stripes, we're going to be adding them essentially to what we did today, which is drawing all the form of stuff first, then drawing the stripes in after. All right. Have a good one. Good luck this week. And don't hesitate to reach out if you have any issues or anything like that.